I confess I'm very happy that I didn't make a major mess up here. So that was, that was a win. All right. Um, now, most of you probably recognized all the verses we read this week, especially if you were here two weeks ago, because I preached a sermon on the exact same passage. And as I was preparing the message for today, which is on the same passages, I found at least two more sermons in here. Um, so I might never get out of First Peter. I don't know. Um, uh, let me start out by just reminding us of First Peter 2, verses 4 through 5. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in God's sight chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Okay, so what's Peter talking about here? Um, to help explain this a little further, I want to go back to the gospel from today, Matthew 16. And in Matthew 16, it's a very famous passage where Jesus asks the question, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? That's one of the most important questions, if not the most important question, that we all have to answer in our lives. Who is Jesus? What are we going to say? Is he some old dead dude? Is he a good moral teacher? Or is he the son of God and my savior? Now, Peter answers correctly. And Jesus says, good. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Upon this rock, I will build my church. The rock that Jesus is talking about is himself. He's talking about himself. And the, that we have the faith that he is who he said he was. Our savior, the son of God. And Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, the word there for rock is the same word that Peter uses for stone in 1 Peter. In fact, I'm not going to bore you with the Greek lesson because only Pastor Emery would care, but um, when Jesus says, upon this rock I will build my church, that's almost the exact same wording in Greek as when Peter says, now you also as living stones are being built into a spiritual house. It's almost exactly the same wording. So what? Two verses in the Bible say almost the same thing. That happens from time to time. But let me ask you this. Who was Jesus speaking to in Matthew when he said that? When he said, upon this rock I will build my church. Who was he talking to? Anybody? Peter. He was talking to Peter. And who wrote the words from 1 Peter that we read earlier? The title's a giveaway. <laughs> Peter. Right? And so basically here's what's happening. Peter is saying, hey, you all know me, I'm Peter, I'm sort of famous, and you all remember when Jesus said to me, upon this rock I will build my church. He's reminding us of what Jesus said, and he's building on that. He's remembering what Jesus said like 20 or 30 years ago. Um, and I said they were almost exactly the same. What's the difference? Well, when Jesus said it, it was the future tense, right? Upon this rock I will build my church, in the future. It's a prophecy. It's a prophecy. And Peter is speaking in the present tense. He's saying, you as living stones are being built up into a spiritual house. Right now. It's happening right now. So he's saying, remember when Jesus said this to me a while back? Well, that's happening now. That prophecy is being fulfilled today. Isn't that cool? And what's even more cool is that that prophecy is still being fulfilled now. 2015, right here in this church. God is still using us as living stones to build his church here at New Hope and in congregations all over the world. Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church. The church in this world, including this congregation, is built on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself, our faith that he is who he said he was. That is our foundation, the foundation of our faith and our lives as Christians. Peter goes on in 1 Peter to drive this home even further. And he quotes a prophecy from Isaiah. So he quoted a prophecy from Jesus. Now he's doing one from Isaiah, which says, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And he also quotes a prophecy from the Psalms. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. So all of these authors in the Bible, throughout the scripture, tons and tons of times, it's the same metaphor, Right? The same metaphor of God building up a house with Jesus as a living stone, us as living stones too, but Jesus is the cornerstone. 
So to understand that, we need to learn what a cornerstone means. That's something maybe a lot of us aren't familiar with. What is a cornerstone? Well, um, in the construction of a Hebrew building, okay, at this time, the cornerstone was the first stone you laid when you were going to build something. A house, a building, whatever it was, the first stone that you laid was called the cornerstone. It was big, it was heavy, it was sturdy. Okay, sometimes it was part of the foundation, and it bore most of the weight of the building. Okay, in architectural terms, the cornerstone takes most of the stress from the building. And there's an entire sermon right there on Jesus taking our stress, but we won't preach that now because I'm doing something else. Um, so the cornerstone takes that weight of the building. It's the most important stone in the building. In a Hebrew building, the cornerstone is the most important stone. It's our foundation. And so the Bible is saying, Jesus is our cornerstone. He's our foundation. He's the rock upon which our faith is built. The rock upon which the whole church is built. The rock upon which our lives as Christians are built. Jesus is our cornerstone. And the Bible just talks about this time and time again. Um, I think, it's my opinion, that one of the problems with the church in America today, and the reason that we don't see the kind of success that we want to see as the church is because many have forgotten that Jesus is our cornerstone. I look, at, I look at a lot of churches and a lot of people and sometimes I hear them talk about things that are good, but they're not talking much about Jesus. You ever notice that? Jesus is our cornerstone. He is our foundation. Nothing else. Jesus himself is the foundation upon which the church is built. And there are a lot of other good things that as the body of Christ we're involved in, right? We're involved with spreading God's love to others, to sharing with our friends and our family and our coworkers and our neighbors and everyone. We're involved with um, obeying the scripture and keeping it the way God wants us to. There are so many things that we're supposed to be involved with as the, as the body of Christ, but none of those things is more important than Jesus himself. None of those things can supersede Jesus as the number one priority in the church, the number one priority in our lives. He is the cornerstone. Are we with me so far? Sort of? Some people sleeping? That's okay. Wake up. It's true in our families and in our personal lives as well. Jesus is our cornerstone. He's the cornerstone of our faith. He's the cornerstone of our family. He's the cornerstone of our personal lives. Um, our relationship with him needs to be the number one priority in our life. Right? That's what the cornerstone means. It means that our relationship with him is the most important thing in our life. And most of us know this. I know this is a shocking revelation. Um, but it's easy to end up outside of that. It's easy to end up outside of God's will by letting something other than Jesus take priority in our life. Something other than our relationship with him take priority. Um, this is what God meant in the Ten Commandments. When he said, behold, I am a jealous God. You will have no other gods before me. Now that's talking about idols, right? Worshiping idols, worshiping other gods. Now most of us are like, well, I don't worship, worship idols. Like, that's weird, right? But what he's saying is you can't have anything else in your life above me. Okay, that's what the Bible calls an idol. Nothing in our life could be more important than Jesus. He is our cornerstone. He is our sure foundation. And... You know, I know most of you here, and I think most of us haven't intentionally set up idols in our life, okay? But let me tell you, it's really easy to let, for it to just happen without us even noticing it. The day-to-day -day grind that we go through in this life, all the stuff we have to do, cleaning the house, the garbage has to be taken out, all this stuff has to be done with the kids, and then more stuff with the kids, and then maybe you get some sleep, and there's all this stuff going on in our lives, Right? And sometimes we get distracted. And it can be easy to allow other things to take priority over Jesus in our life. It can be easy for us to start relying on something other than our cornerstone, other than Jesus Christ, which is where our faith has to rest, the number one priority in our lives. It's easy for us to break the first commandment and to let something else come above God in our lives. Um, you all love me. Right? This is a safe place where I can, where I can share a little bit. Right? 
Um, I've never intentionally set up an idol in my life. I've never intentionally said, you know, I'm going to make such and such more important than Jesus in my life. I'm going to make this thing my new cornerstone. This is the new foundation of my life instead of Jesus. I'm going to set up this idol. I've never intentionally done that. But it has happened. Okay? It's happened numerous times, sadly. Um, it's so easy to let other things end up being more important to us than Jesus. Other things that we base our decisions on. Other things that we look to before we look to God. Maybe we base our financial decisions on how much money we have as opposed to on Jesus. Maybe our priority is on our family or on doing work in the church or whatever it is. There's so many things, some of them good, some of them not as good, but there's so many priorities that can take place of Jesus as our top priority without us even realizing that it's happening. And this has happened to me, okay? It's happened to me numerous times. There have been times where I have let money and my concern about how much money there will be make my decisions for me rather than letting Jesus be the Lord of my life in the area of finances, okay? Well, that's a very common one, and it's an easy one to do. Um, but it's also happened with the, the good things in my life. I've let my family, at times, become a higher priority in my life than Jesus. I didn't realize I was doing it. I didn't know it, but I was doing that, okay? I have let theology, especially when I was, you know, in school studying the Bible and everything, there were times where I let theology become more important to me than Jesus himself, that's not okay, right? There have been numerous times where I've let ministry be more important in my life than Jesus himself. I've based my life more on ministry and what that meant for me to minister to others than on Jesus himself. Now, I'm a pastor, all right? That's a big pitfall. I'm a, I'm a Bible teacher and a discipler and an equipper and all these things, but those things aren't my cornerstone. Those things aren't my foundation. They're not the thing that my life is built on and that everything else comes from, right? My foundation, my cornerstone is Jesus Christ. He is my God and I can't have anything else above him. I can't let anything in my life be an idol above him. And this happens, I think, to a lot of us from time to time. And when it's happened to me, Jesus has come to me um, very kindly. You know, Jesus is the kindest person that I know. He's the kindest person that I know. And Jesus is not, we don't worship angry God, okay? I've said this before in here, but I think it's important because so many Christians have a warped view of who God really is. God is not a mean old man in the sky carrying a stick with a scowl on his face waiting for you to mess up so that he can smack you, get you back in line, okay? That's not Jesus. That's not the Jesus that we worship. The Jesus that we worship is kind. He is the kindest person that I have ever known. And when I have found myself in these places where my foundation's getting a bit sandy, right? And I'm trusting a little more in myself or in my family or in ministry or whatever it is than I am in Jesus without even realizing it, okay? What happens to me? Well, when our foundation isn't on Jesus, when he's not our cornerstone, when we're unknowingly breaking the first commandment, we're outside of God's will, right? And when we're outside of God's will, he can't bless us to the degree that he wants to bless us. And so my life starts getting kind of messed up. And things start going ways that I don't understand why this is happening. And it's getting annoying and I'm getting frustrated. And so eventually I do the right thing and I come to the Lord and I say, Lord, what is going on? And he says, dude, because Jesus calls me dude sometimes. He says, dude, look at these things you're doing. Look at the decisions that you're making. I'm like, all right, what's wrong with them? He's like, nothing's wrong in and of itself, but look at why you're making these decisions. Look at the stuff that you're doing. Is, am I the priority in these areas, or are you letting something else be more important to you than me? And I wish I could say I instantly fell on my face and worshiped God and repented. But sometimes, instead, I get defensive, right? That's sort of the natural human response when someone confronts us with something. I'm like, no, God, I, I, you're always first in my life, no matter what, because that's what I learned in Sunday school, and that's true. You're always first in my life. And, and, and Jesus is like, but dude, am I really? Look at what you're doing. Am I really? 
in this particular area of your life. So I did what I should have done right away and humbled myself. I humbled myself before the Lord and the Holy Spirit opened my eyes to see things as they really were, okay? And I looked at what I was doing, the decisions I was making, and where my heart was really at. And I said, oh my God, I'm sorry. I really am doing that, aren't I? <laughs> I, I, I didn't know it. And he's like, I know, I know. But I love you too much to let you do this. Jesus said, I love you too much to leave you in this place where you're outside of my will. Because when you're outside of my will, I can't bless you with all the things I want to bless you with. And I said, oh, that's bad. So I humbled myself and I said, Lord, I need you to help me figure out what I'm doing wrong and reprioritize my life so that you're really Lord of my life in everything, every area, that you are my cornerstone, my sure foundation, my number one, right? And it was great. A couple years later, it happened again. Uh, without my realizing it, and again, and again, and again. Um, I wish I could stand here today and say it'll never happen again, but I know myself better than that at this point. And I know that at some point, I will probably unknowingly allow some other things to take priority in my life over Jesus. That's just part of what it is to be in the middle of sanctification, <laughs> the process, right? But what I know is that if and when that happens, Jesus will come to me again in kindness and say, hey, dude, look at what you're doing. Is this what you want to be doing? Because that's how Jesus acts with us. He's, he's not the mean old man that beats us over the head with a stick. That's not how he interacts with us. He comes to us in kindness because he loves us. He loves us too much to allow us to live any other kind of life than the exact kind of life that he wants us to have. And for that to happen, Jesus needs to be the number one priority in our life, in every area of our life, the Lord of our life in everything. He needs to be our cornerstone, our sure foundation. Amen? But it's so easy, and we all know this, right? This is not earth-shattering news. But it's so easy to let the stuff of life get in the way without us even realizing it. And before we know it, Jesus has dropped to number two or maybe number three in one area or another in our lives. Um, my encouragement to us, you know, this is one of those messages that I think we all need to hear every once in a while because it's so easy to let the things of life get in the way. Um, my encouragement to us is that we pray about this over the next week and allow the Holy Spirit to search us, as David said in the Psalms, allow the Holy Spirit to search our heart and show us if maybe there are areas in our life that he'd like us to change, if maybe there's a priority or two that's a little out of whack that he'd like us to move. Because God wants us to be perfectly in his will so that he can bless us as much as possible because he loves us. He doesn't want us to be outside of his will where bad things start happening. Amen? So why don't we just get the ball rolling? Why don't we pray right now, if you'll just pray with me. Father God, we thank you so much that you are our cornerstone. We thank you that you love us so much that you're not willing to allow us to have a life that is less than what you have called us to. I thank you that you love us so much that you come to us like a loving parent to show us when we're doing things a little bit wrong. And I ask you, Lord, that over the next week you would open up our hearts and our minds to see any area that maybe you would like us to work on. And in fact, right now, Father God, we're just going to take a moment of silence. Holy Spirit, I ask you to just come and search our hearts and know us and to reveal anything to our hearts or our minds right now that you might want us to deal with in our lives. Just bring that to our minds as we spend a moment in silence right now.